All right, what's up you guys? This is AP Bio day, what day are we on? Day 11 in the third nine weeks. So, sorry I was absent yesterday. Um, yeah, I one of my kids got sick and I had to stay home with her. Nothing major, um, fine today, no COVID or anything like that. And so, um, that's why I was out yesterday, and uh, sorry I got kind of left behind, but uh, hopefully you read through part three like I asked you to, and we're going to talk and kind of go through that today, but you should have a good background of what, what is going on in part three of the biotech notes. But first, we need to finish part two. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough. This stuff is all very complicated, and so it's very important. You take notes, you listen, you read, and you ask questions if you're not understanding something. I'm going to do my best to explain this, and um, like I said, if we need to go back and look at something or I need to go back and answer some questions, that is what I'm here, here for and why I get paid the big bucks. I do not make big bucks on YouTube for clarification. They haven't approved my channel yet. Okay. On 362 at the top and 363 at the bottom, we're going to look at operons. But before we get to that, let's just do a quick review of bacterial. It, your note writer calls it bacterial variation processes here. First one, transformation. This is, uh, how many of y'all remember Griffith's experiment? Remember what happened with the mice? What do you do? Oh. Oh God, y'all messed this up so bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he had, well, he had, so Griffith's experiment, if you go back and look at it, he injected mice, some of them with um, non pathogenic bacteria, so ones that weren't harmful. They didn't die. He injected some with harmful bacteria, they died. Then he killed the heat. Heat killed the harmful bacteria, and the, the mice didn't die because the bacteria were dead. But then he mixed the harmful heat-killed bacteria with the harmless live bacteria, and he injected the mice, and what happened? They died. And so this process of transformation took place where you have the bacteria that had the harmful DNA exchanged some of that DNA, or you know they lost some of it. The, the bacteria that were still alive took it up. And then they became harmful, and then they, they wound up killing some of the mice. So that transformation process is the changing of the DNA. Now, um, you guys are going to do this next week because you guys in class will be doing a lab on transformation where you have some bacteria that you're going to have to grow in a Petri dish, and then you're going to expose them to a plasmid that has a gene from a jellyfish for glowing in the dark. And you're going to try to get those bacteria to take up that plasmid, that small little circular piece of the DNA that's not the main chromosome. Remember, bacteria have one large chromosome, and then they have small little circular pieces of chromosome called plasmids. And so you're going to try to get those bacteria to take up that DNA, and then if they do, then they will glow in the dark. Delightful. Um, some of you will be successful. Some of you may not. We'll see what happens. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. So the next thing, transduction, where new DNA is carried into um, and inserted into the bacterial DNA code, and that is done by bacteria. No. What inserts the? Where's the DNA come from? In transduction. Do y'all have the notes? Are y'all looking at the notes? Oh, viruses. Viruses. So as bacteria and viruses are fighting one another, oh, the bacteria gets infected. Virus goes in. Um, inserts its DNA in there and you have some changes in the bacterial DNA and can produce um, viruses from there. Let's see. And the conjugation, the third part, this is the one we talked about earlier in the year where you have this whip-like structure that's used in bacterial sex that reaches out and grabs another bacterium. The pili or um, that structure is used to exchange um, plasmids between different bacteria. So bacterial sex is in effect uh, only just an exchanging of DNA. You don't have two organisms creating an organ uh, a different organism. You have two organisms exchanging DNA 
Um, and then basically they start cloning themselves. And so the resulting organisms are a little bit different. It's kind of a loose definition of what bacterial sex is. And then our plasmids. So these are plasmids that have a resistant gene. So did I tell y'all my son had a uh, MRSA when he was little? I'll tell you the story. So when he was about two years old, my son had MRSA, which is a, an antibiotic resistant form of bacteria. So basically a bacteria that's evolved and it's not affected by most of our normal antibodies that we produce to kill bacteria. So he had a little mosquito bite on his forearm and some of that bacteria got into his skin, under his skin and started growing and streaking across the skin. It got really red and started spreading and swelling. He got a really bad fever. Um, they assigned him some kind of like baseline antibiotics. Now to give you an idea, antibiotics, there's different levels of antibiotics. So there's your normal ones like uh, penicillin and amoxicillin and all the cillins you should see, which is kind of bad for my son because he's allergic to penicillin. But anyway, and then you go up and then there's different levels of different types of antibiotics. Some are much, much stronger than others. Like penicillin, you can take a pill, you can get a shot. Um, once you get up to like the high level stuff, you're having to be in the hospital for a certain amount of time um, and you're like getting them intravenously. So it's very, it's very different. So anyway, he's two year old, he gets a mosquito bite, Bacteria get in, they start eating away under the flesh there. And so basically he had to go in. Uh, the, nor the first antibiotics they gave him, gave him didn't work. His fever was still really high. I really think the doctor we saw didn't really know what she was looking at, to be honest. Um, I think if she had recognized that it was MRSA, we probably should have went ahead and went to the hospital. Um, and then, so we had to go in the hospital and doctor had to go in. They had to do surgery on his arm, cut it open express as much as they could and then pack the inside of it with um, some antibiotics and then put him on like an IV antibiotic. He's only like two years old at this point. So um, he got over it. He was fine. It's just hard, a uh, hard something for, uh, you know, somebody that young to deal with. So that's where they are plasmid, meaning they have a resistance. Now this is where life takes a turn for the worse for us at some point, I think, because if you get a large number of bacteria that become resistant to antibiotics, what's gonna happen? You won't be able to have a specific immune response. Yeah, we won't be able to fight off those bacteria and then people will die. There's already been some versions of tuberculosis that's become antibiotic resistant. And so that's kind of the worst worry is where you have a an airborne disease like that that's resistant to antibiotics, it's bacterial. I mean, you, you're talking about a lot of people could die in that instance, okay? Um, if it gets spread around enough. So, next thing, mm, part three, transcription control mechanisms. These are things that control or regulate transcription, which in effect is gonna control what? Protein. The production of proteins, very good. All right. One here is listed, we're not, and this is probably the one you need to know less about, are the transposons. There's a really good discovery video. If you, if you look on YouTube, transposons discovery, um, that's really good kind of explaining and animating, showing this. I'm just gonna give you a brief description here. But th these are most famous because they're known as what, Katie? Jumping genes. Jumping genes. These genes are actually able to translocate and move from one place to another. You see this a lot with prokaryotes um, and some, I think, yeah, and also eukaryotes, some eukaryotes as well. Um, I don't know how often they occur here. I'm going to be honest, I don't know a great deal about transposons other than they jump from, can move from one location to another. Um, jump, you can see, is kind of a, I don't know if jump's the appropriate word. They can move location. So, why are they doing this? Why does this happen? Um, I'm gonna speculate here. Here's, here's the effect that they have. Um, when the genes move, it can create or reverse mutations that take place. So it can have an effect on mutations. It can alter your genetic material. It can, it, it in effect, is going to change your genome, okay, when you have a gene that jumps from one location to the next. So, I could only see this, I couldn't really find a lot about like the why this happens. Um, the only thing that I can foresee is that, is that it's gonna create some more genetic variety in organisms. So the lady that studied this, Barbara McClintock initially, 
Um, she studied this in maize, which is corn. corn. And so I would think maybe in like plants like that, the more variety you have, the more, you know, in life in general, the more genetic diversity you have um, is going to lead to more what? A better chance of survival. survival. Now, you may have some mutations or jumping of genes that is harmful, but if overall you have enough, you know, changes, like in the instance of corn, where some individuals become much more fit, then, you know, in the long run it could be beneficial. Um, researchers all, also use these transposins, these enzymes, um, that help to do this, to alter DNA. So sometimes you want to cause mutations to take place or you want to cause changes. Um, and so some researchers use that as well. So it's a way of, it's this kind of odd thing where, where genes move from one location to another. And I'm not sure if it really happens randomly or what the mechanism is there. You'll have to look at more about that. Um, or if it's just solely for the purpose of that variety. But um, like I said, there's a good video kind of explaining or showing what it looks like um, that Discovery's put out if you have a chance. All right. Now, more importantly, something you need to know is the operon system on page 362 and page 363. Today's class is sponsored by Urban Cookhouse. Or at least they gave me this drink. The uh, National Guard sometimes gives us, um, supplies dinner for us at, uh, once or twice a year so. We appreciate you guard members out there. All right, the operon system. Um, something you need to write down. Prog, P-R-O-G. There's actually a short video on this I'm gonna show y'all at the end of class. Um, Mr. Bozeman on Bozeman Science. He has a really good, if you type in Bozeman Operon, he's got a fantastic video um, on how this works. There's some animations that go along with it that uh, I do not have capabilities of, of showing here. So we're just going to look in the book real quick. We're going to talk about this. And like I said, the video is going to do a great job of explaining what this is. So um, read number two and three for us, Walker. Operon operator controls RNA polymerase access to the DNA strand. Operon is part of the promoter sequence. It is located between the TATA box and the start code. Okay, TATA box, what is that? It's like where it starts. Yeah, so the TATA box is where, like, hey, this is where your RNA polymerase, all the enzymes and proteins that initiate transcription, this is where they all attach. And so you see the operator is between the, um, in that promoter region, between the RNA polymerase and where the gene is. Now, why do you think the cell wants to control when these genes are expressed? basically controlling protein synthesis. Why would you want to control that? Let's say you're making too much. Okay, if you're making too much, you want to shut it off. What else? You don't, have you don't have enough, you want to turn it on. So really, that's the purpose of this operon system. It's a way of regulating or controlling whether these are turned on or off. And you see this primarily in bacteria, and I'm trying to think, I don't know how often this is, these show up in eukaryotes, but um, I think they're primarily studied, the ones we're going to look at anyway in bacteria or prokaryotes. Okay, number four and five. Mason, read that for us. Repressor and peripressor, these molecules act as off switch. Inducer, this molecule acts as an on switch. Okay, so you got two pretty simple things here. Repressor turns that gene off... I say turn the gene off. It turns it off where the gene can't be copied. Okay, so it's it's like a stop. It's like almost like a safety on a safety switch. You've turned it off. It can't go any farther. The uh, the RNA polymerase, the um, init or excuse me, an inducer turns it on where it can call it, where it can um, replicate that DNA into mRNA. Okay, these are both negative feedback loops. Negative feedback meaning what? Yeah, so if you made too much of one thing, a negative feedback loop moves it back. If you're not have enough of something, it moves it in the opposite direction and helps you produce it. So it's, uh, negative feedback loops are always about maintaining what? Homeostasis. Homeostasis, a state of balance, equilibrium, whatever you want to call it, yeah. So let's look at a couple examples here. And like I said, Mr. Bozeman is going to do a better job than I will of explaining this. On 362 at the top, 
tryptophan. You have a the operator system here and the promoter region. Um, so let's go through and actually label the prog, P-R-O-G. P stands for? Promoter. promoter. R stands for? Um, no. Re repressor. So these are all things that are going to be in this region together here. The O stands for? Operator. operator. So you've got the promoter, you've got the repressor, the operator, and then you've got the what? Gene. Gene. So tryptophan is an amino acid that organisms need. Remember how many amino acids we have? 20. 20. And if these bacteria that it's showing in the picture here, if they don't have enough of one, what needs to happen? You, make more. you need to make some more, okay? And so basically what happens here is when you have a lot of tryptophan present, it's in part B over here on the le left side of 362. When there's a lot of tryptophan present, what does it do to that repressor? It activates the repressor. The presser, repressor does what to the operator? Yeah, it hooks to it and basically it turns it off. So if you've got enough tryptophan, it's gonna turn off the production of producing more tryptophan. Does that make sense? And then if you run out of tryptophan, so the repressor, what's gonna to happen to that repressor? It's gonna inactivate, it's gonna come loose and then that gene is going to be expressed where you make more make more tryptophan, okay? So that's the tryptophan one. Now, the one at the bottom right over here on 363 works basically the opposite, okay? Um, how many of y'all know what lacta uh, lactase is? Or lactose, excuse me, not lactase. What's lactose? Lactose is from milk. What is it? Lactose. Is it sugar? sugar. Sugar found in what? Milk. Yeah, in dairy products. So, milk, ice cream, cheese, yogurt, whatever else I'm forgetting. So, um, you probably heard about this because a lot of people are lactose intolerant. Now, it's interesting to note, and this is probably a good evolutionary lesson that I'll save for later on. Depending on your place of origin, like whether you're, you know, of African or Asian descent or European descent, um, the chance of you being lactose intolerant varies widely. I wanna say people from Asia, a lot of times it's closer to like 90% lactose intolerant. People of African descent, one thing I said, saw maybe like 50% are lactose intolerant. People of European descent, especially Northern European descent, typically are very lactose tolerant. Um, and that's probably because people there, that's kind of the area where people started drinking milk. They started domesticating cows and goats and sheep and stuff, and people started drinking milk from them. And so normally most people, most all people can, when they're a baby, they can digest milk until they're two or three, and when they're mom, when they're old enough and they're weaned off, and then, you know, some people wind up, basically they lose that ability to process milk. Now, sorry. So this is in bacteria. We have bacteria where? In your digestive tract. You've got more bacteria in your stomach than you do have cells in your body. So you've got bacteria that are helping you to break down, or somebody remind me to talk about what lactose intolerant actually happens here in a little bit. Um, you've got these bacteria in your stomach that are breaking down this sugar. And so how does it know how to break down the sugar, okay? So our bodies help break it down, but also these bacteria help us. So basically, if you're like lactose intolerant, these bacteria are gonna get, are you, even if you're not lactose intolerant and you like just get too carried away with the bluebell Mariah and you're just eating too much of it, um, what happens if you're not able to process all that dairy? You start getting, you make it a little nauseated, but normally what happens is you get like really gassy and you get like diarrhea because your body's like, it's coming through, you can't process it, and so it's like a freight train, you're not stopping it. Um, and so these bacteria, they're trying to keep up and process it, and they're producing all this gas in the process of that, and so you get gassy and you know super flagellant, and then you may have diarrhea because your body's like, I can't handle that much bluebell, even though it's delicious. And so, I'm not speaking from personal experience or anything. <laughs> so, um, but that's what happens. So these bacteria are trying to help you break this stuff down, okay? 
in moderation. Remember that always. So when lactose is present, what happens to the repressor? It's inactivated. Good. So this is totally different. If lactose is present, the repressor is inactivated, it's removed, and that allows that gene to be expressed. So an enzyme is produced that helps the bacteria to do what? So the repressor is inactivated, so the gene is expressed, so the bacteria makes an en enzyme that helps it to do what? Break down, Break down lactose. So it's like, hey, here's a bunch of lactose. The repressor that's normally having it shut off is, is pulled away. Genes are expressed. Enzymes are made. Enzymes are made. They, they're used to break down the lactose. And then once the lactose goes away, what do you think happens to the repressor? It detaches and it goes back up and hooks onto that, that um, DNA strand where the, uh, where the operator is. And so it stops production because you don't need to make enzymes to break down lactose if you don't have lactose. Don't have lactose. Very good. So that's what this, op the whole system is a way of controlling protein synthesis. Do you need that protein? Do you need that enzyme? We'll, we'll make it. If you got too much of, too much of something, then we'll, we'll turn it off. So um, both of those are kind of working at different ends. You're breaking down something with one, you're building something with another, but it's all about a way of regulating it so that you don't produce too much or too little. Okay? So um, it says that both of these are negative feedback loops, but it looks like the lactose example is a positive. No, no, no. Remember, negative feedback just means you're keeping something in balance. So if you... And don't think about it in terms of the lactose. Think about it in terms of the enzyme. Okay. So if you're producing the enzyme to break down lactose, a positive feedback would mean you just keep you keep making more and more and more and more and more until there's some no you know something completely finished. In this case, you're just making enough to where it breaks it down and then you're stopping it. Okay. So you don't want to make too much of that enzyme. I see what you're kind of going at though there. Um. So anyway, let's turn over to part three of biotech genetic engineering on page four twelve. Now, you guys yesterday were supposed to read through this diligently. I gave you a sheet to read through. You people online, I'll send this to you, and you guys are just going to have to um, video observe our... You know what? There's a, actually an online version of a similar lab I think I'm going to make y'all do, actually. But I'm going to post a video of the lab that we do on Friday just so you guys get an idea of what's going on in class. Um, so bacterial, um, using bacteria in genetic engineering on part three. You guys were supposed to read through this. You're supposed to annotate it. Who had questions? Y'all learned everything from this? You know how bacteria replicate? You know how we can take a bacteria and use it to produce human growth hormone? Yeah, there's a question about the, uh, mm -hmm. when it recombines mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. the sticky ends. Yeah, um, something How's it coming back together? Okay, let me go through this real quick. Y'all turn to page 412 in your book, and 412 and 413, and so let me kind of go through, explain this process of how we use bacteria in genetic engineering. I think I gave y'all an example of this the other day with maybe insulin, right? Like if somebody doesn't have enough insulin, then they're allergic to like animal insulin that you can produce your own using bacteria. So on page 412, excuse me, in the Campbell Biology book, um, basically what happens here is they give you an example of HGH. So let's say, you know, you're going to the doctor and you're on the low end of the curve and you're not growing or maybe you've got some form of dwarfism and the doctor says, hey, I think we can help you out. We're going to give you a little bit of human growth hormone. You're not producing enough. Okay. So where could you get that human growth hormone from? Yeah, you could suck it out of somebody else's pituitary gland, or maybe you can make some through bacteria. We don't want to attack people's pituitary glands. It's dangerous. So, you take some bacteria, and let, we're going to use a plasmid because those are the exchangeable pieces of DNA we can insert in the bacteria. So, you're going to take that plasmid, and you've got to cut it, okay? So, you're going to cut it using what? What? How do you cut the plasmid? 
you use restriction enzymes. enzymes so you're going to take these enzymes restriction enzymes and cut that plasma now why do bacteria have these enzymes that cut dna really one. what do bacteria get in fights with all the time and like to kill viruses, viruses. good so bacteria and viruses get into it and bacteria and they've developed these enzymes these restriction enzymes in order to kill viruses so they see a virus, they recognize it, they chop it up, and that's how they render its DNA or RNA useless, okay? So they've created these restriction enzymes that cut at specific places. So basically what we've figured out and hijacked is we can take these restriction enzymes, different ones, use them to cut DNA, and it cuts it at a specific point, so where there's a specific DNA sequence, okay? And so you cut that plasmid, and then you would have to go into someone who makes human growth hormone, like take a cell, you use the same restriction enzyme. You gotta use the same enzyme so it cuts it the same way. You go in, you cut out that gene, and then you insert it into that ba uh, bacterial plasma. Now, the next thing it starts talking about sticky ends. Who picked up on what the sticky end was? You might. Yeah, yeah, so if you're cutting DNA, well, let's say this is your DNA sequence here, and here are like your nitrogen bases. I like to think of DNA as like wood. I like working with wood and building stuff, so you don't want to cut it straight across and have like one piece over here and one piece over here and it just flapped. What happens when you take two pieces of wood and you try to just glue them end to end like this? They're not going to be very strong, right? probably not going to stay. Kind of the same thing happens in bacteria. They use these plasmids and it cuts, but it doesn't cut evenly. You see that, Nate? Don't pass out. It cuts it like this, where it leaves a little piece hanging over on each side, okay? And so, like, up here, you can see, like, my black is one side, and then here's my other gene on the other side. So, it leaves something for that new DNA to grab a hold of and to hook onto, okay? And so when you insert a new gene, it gives it something to hook onto. Just like in woodworking, if you cut out a little, like a piece of wood, you cut out about half of it on each side and you make a little tenon that can overlap, you can glue them and they're much stronger. So that's kind of how the, the, the process works in, in bacterial, um, when you're using them for genetic engineering, you use these restriction enzymes to cut, it leaves the little, this part right here is the sticky end, okay, the part that's hanging over and then it leaves a place for the other DNA to hook onto, okay? So that is the sticky end. So you insert that new gene, hook it into the plasmid. Now next week you guys are going to be, like I said, replicating or using the glow or the glow piglo plasmid, that's what it's called. Um, and they have already done this for you. I do not have these capabilities, nor do I know how to do, go about actually doing it in the lab. So in the lab, they've already taken, cut out a gene from a jellyfish, used certain restriction enzyme, they cut it out, they inserted that gene for fluorescence into the plasmid, and you guys are gonna have plasmids, and you're gonna have to grow some bacteria. So you have to grow your bacteria, and then you have to take the plasmid and try to get the bacteria to take the plasmid up. And then if it does, it will start expressing those genes. So in the case of our bacteria we're growing, they should glow in the dark because they'll bioluminesce. In the case of this person on 412, they may produce, that bacteria may produce uh, HGH or human growth hormone. Or in the case of um, the other examples on 412, we could alter bacteria to break down oil spills or insert genes into plants to, um, make them resistant to certain types of pests. So this is kind of where CRISPR comes in, and I'm not gonna get into CRISPR today, other than basically they figured out how to use these restriction enzymes to cut and paste genes at, at more of the human level. This before was just done in bacteria. Now we're getting to the point where we can do this in people and individual cells. So that's kind of the future of genetic engineering, okay? Um, so I'm going to stop there. We're going to go and we're going to watch this video and I will put a link in the description for you guys. Um, it's really good on explaining um, 
what you call it, operons. If you looked on 413 in the picture there, um, yesterday you could kind of see the sticky ends, how they stick out and, are, and overlap one another. Tomorrow we're gonna get into plasmin mapping, hopefully. And so we're gonna talk about how we actually figure out where genes are located on different bacterial plasmids. You guys take care.